Good morning. We return uh, this morning to our study in Proverbs. Uh, we're going to be in Proverbs 31 this morning. We will go back and pick up one of our earlier chapters of Proverbs before we do the last two sections in, uh, in this quarter. And those last two sections are going to be in the Song of Solomon. So um, well, as, we, as we start this morning, we're going to be in Proverbs 31. But first, let's go to prayer. Father, we, uh, we, we ask that you, you give us wisdom, that you grant us ears to hear and eyes to see and an appetite for, for your will, not just to know, but to understand, and not just to understand, but be transformed by the, the divine wisdom, the divine personing of wisdom, uh, that our lives would be honorable in your eyes, your sight. Father, we ask that you now Give us ears to hear and eyes to see as we turn our hearts towards home, as we turn our hearts towards you. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. This morning, we, uh, we're, again, we're going to be in, in Proverbs, Proverbs 31. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and read the entirety of that chapter. And, and as I'm doing that or before, if you would have your scripture open, it's always best to to be reading along in your own scripture uh, as we uh, as we turn our hearts. But I'll tell you ahead of time we're gonna we're gonna focus on kind of two pieces this morning. Part one is gonna be fairly short, and uh, it's a little bit of a preamble into part two. Uh, but uh, I I I, uh, we, I, I we, we, it's it's tough to kind of pass by thirty one without picking up this this one small passage. So we'll we'll focus a little bit on the front end on this on this first part, and then we'll focus the primary part of our time this morning on the second part. So to, uh, to begin, let's begin and put Proverbs 31 on the table. The sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. Oh my son, oh my son of my womb, oh son of my vows, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, oh Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine nor rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees, and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty, and remember their misery no more. And speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. A wife of noble character who can find... She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like merchant ships bringing in food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark and she provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and then buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously, and her arms are strong for her task. She sees her trading is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. In her hands, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household. All of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed, and she's clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So that's uh, Proverbs 31. It's the last uh, last chapter of Proverbs in uh, in the book of Proverbs. And one of the, the first things we would want to make note of is, is that uh, this is... Is recorded by King Lemuel, and I, I, I wish we, I wish I had a a, a a little more background on who Lemuel was. Uh, 
not we, we just don't we just don't have a, a lot of information we know his name Lemuel is a Hebrew name and it means uh, devoted to God or of God uh, so at least his name uh, is representative of his nature or his character and it unless I unless I stretch this too far I, I, I would also consider that that his name as given to him by his mother may represent her nature and her character as well but what uh, we would want to note on the front end about Lemuel is, is that this isn't his oracle. This is, these aren't his words. Uh, he's recorded these words. It's actually an oracle from his mother. His mother is the one who, who uh, uh, spoke or created or drafted or, or uh, 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 infused this into Lemuel. So these are actually his mom's words, not him. And so from from that, uh, I think we it it I th I think uh, I'm pretty certain I'm, I'm this is true that these would be the only proverbs that are written by a woman. The rest of the proverbs, I believe, are all written by uh, by men. And so the voice here is the voice of a woman to her son. And so from the beginning, we we might say. Um, is is this uh, uh, written for our young men? That our young men should read this and uh, take guidance and counsel on uh, on how to pursue or, or how to to ferret through the possibilities when it comes to selecting a wife. Uh, would it be possibly written? Uh, for a young lady to say that that as you mature from girlhood to womanhood uh, these are the characteristics that that you should cultivate in your own life uh, that 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 make you a a, a good strong uh, a woman to be a good strong spouse to your husband uh, it, is it possible that uh, um, that this is written maybe uh, to be digested also by um, older women. That that uh, through Lemuel, Lemuel's mother is is counseling other women of her own um, uh, of her own kind of generation to say uh, uh, this is a this is trustworthy. You can invest into your daughters in this way. Uh, it could it be written to older men to say this is what you need to counsel your son with uh, as your son becomes uh, a young man and into his marrying years uh, and just remember that in the Jewish family and I would not say this independently of the Jewish family I would say this is this is the case for every human being uh, that and, and we're going to get into this in a minute but uh, every human being incomplete without their spouse and so when um, uh, when a, a, a man is, is a father is counseling his son uh, he would be counseling his son from the perspective that you are incomplete until you meet the woman who will complete you the wife that will complete you and vice versa for the young lady you are incomplete until you meet the uh, the man who becomes your husband and completes you uh, but in the Jewish family this is this is this is, this is uh, inside the culture. I'm not sure this is, is fair to say that, that it's necessarily blanketly true, but at least inside the Jewish culture, it's a shame to be unmarried. It is, a sh it is a, uh, you bring shame upon your family if you do not choose a spouse, uh, that it is, it is important, it's valuable, it is critical to the, the Jewish life to, um, uh, to make finding a spouse a very high priority and building a family foundationally priority a foundational priority in your life and it is it is it is as much to uh, continue the Jewish line the Jewish nation of people as it is um, beneficial to you as an individual person now this is where I'll, I'll stretch out a little bit and say I, I think every human being 
would learn from this focus that the Jewish family has on what it means to build a family and that there is a, a, a right way and a wrong way to do that. And there is a way that God has, has set out for that to happen. So having said all of that about uh, Lemuel and his mother and, and who might this be written to, I'm, I'm going to suggest that it's not any one of them, it's all of them. That, that uh, it is written, or it is orated from Lemuel's mother to Lemuel. Lemuel has remembered it, has valued it so highly that he has written it down. And by virtue of the Holy Spirit who drives every word written in Scripture, it is then recorded now in uh, the, the Holy Writ of Scripture. And is, it is timelessly valuable. So uh, with that as a, as a kind of front end, um, let's start into this kind of first part of it. And I, and I wouldn't want to uh, um, spend too horribly much time on this first part without uh, 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 and, and uh, lose track of the second part. So I'm going to try to make this first part pretty quick. And the first part that I want to focus on is actually 31, 8, and 9. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of those who are destitute, and speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Now, this is a uh, this is certainly something that that we have we have heard before in, in in Proverbs, and we've we've focused before a little bit on. But fundamentally, what Lemuel's mother is saying to uh, 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 to to young Lemuel is that uh, that there is a a value, uh, 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 an invaluable asset to caring about another person. And there is, and, and I, I want to I be really clear here because um, Lemuel's mother gives us the motive for this too. This is not uh, a humanism. Uh, this is not a, a, a mere benevolence. Th there is a uh, a very specific motive that Lemuel's mother gives Lemuel when, when she says this to Lemuel. Now, remember that this is in the context of uh, that, um, that portrait of a noble wife. Um, and so uh, I would say that, that even though I want to use this as a kind of a preamble to our study this morning, uh, I would say that it's possible that Lemuel's mother is speaking about this as a bit of a preamble to the verses that will follow here, that there's a, a fundamental character that you should develop, and that is to care about another. Now, this comes uh, uh, in the, uh, the language of Scripture with a bit of a scar, and the scar is from a deep wound in the culture of Israel, and the, the best place to see that, that deep wound, and, and we see it in a number of places, but the best place, I think one, one of the best places maybe, to see this is actually in the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel gives us, um, from, a, from the prophet's perspective, a piece of history that we should focus on. So where I've turned is Ezekiel 16, 48 and 49. Now this reads, Now this was the sin of your sister. And, no, I, I'm sorry, that's 49. I want to back up to 48. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters never did what you and your daughters have done. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. Now, just to be sure, we understand, he's going to unfold the sin of uh, Israel's sister Sodom. Uh, first, we should make note that that's a smack in the face. Uh, this uh, to, to say that the cities of Sodom, the culture of Sodom, the culture of Gomorrah, as, as sinful as they were, um, uh, God is turning to Israel and will say, your sins are so great that I liken you unto the sins of the most sinful s cities, the sinful, most sinful cultures in history to date. And, and that, should, that, should, that, should rub, uh, that should rub raw Israel. But, it, but he's not done just by saying, this is, this is, you're likened unto this. This is you, that, that actually what you've done is worse than what they did. So 
as we as as we begin verse 49 again now this was the sin of your sister Sodom she and her daughters were arrogant overfed and unconcerned they did not help the poor and the needy they were haughty and did detestable things before me the the the, the, the great sin of Israel is idolatry. Second, and like unto it, is that Israel became obsessed with themselves and no longer cared about anybody else. And they get, it got to the point, uh, and we see this in, in other prophets' language, where they became so obsessed with self, they didn't even care about each other. It's not just they didn't care about other nations, but they didn't care about each other. Now. Without going into too much detail here, this was this this was to 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 disconcern ourselves with another person made in the likeness and image of God uh, is is a huge and egregious sin against God to to devalue another person made in the likeness and image of God, uh, but it 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 goes a bit beyond that when it when when God says that the reason that I created you as a nation was to minister to the rest of the world. That I call, you were not a people, I created you as a people through, the, through your father Abraham, the 12 tribes and the entire nation. And I did all this for a purpose because I would reveal myself to you and then through you to the rest of the world. So it was fundamental that Israel should look upon the rest of the world with the eyes that God gave them to see a lost and dying world and to care about the lost and dying world and to minister to have a passion for the lost and dying world and so when God says yours calls them calls Sodom and Gomorrah your sister Israel and says that your sins are worse than your sister what he's saying is is that 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 you not caring about other people is first and foremost a sin against me personally because I made them in my life and image. But secondly, it's a sin against the very reason that I created you as a people. It was your job to care about these people. It was your job to minister to these people. And it was your job to see them, as Christ would say, as a sheep without a shepherd, lost and oppressed, which is the language Jesus used when he described those who did not know the one true living God or did not know salvation. So so that 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 fundamental sin is what Lemuel's mother is telling us. Speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, the rights who are destitute, speak and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and the needy, care about somebody else. Now the but the the motive there is 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 she gives us also who cannot speak for themselves. The motive that you have to, to serve another in need is for those who simply can't, who can't. And specifically in other language, the widows and orphans are the two classes of people that are specifically identified in scripture as those who cannot speak for themselves. So the motive we're given, it is, it is a compassion because they have not and you have. That you should, not that they don't have compassion, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm this is probably a poor way to say it, the, the, a compassion for those who do not have. And that compassion for those who do not have wells up in you simply because you do. It is your, if you have the ability to speak for the poor, the destitute, the widow, the orphan, specifically those who cannot help themselves, it is your job to step into those lives. Now, um, there's, a, there's one other place that I would I would love I, I, I'm sorry that, I, that I'd like to, to focus here for just a second and uh, and it has to do with the nature of the service that we have in other people's lives and that is in uh, James 2 14 uh, through 26 and we'll go there James 14 um, I'm sorry change uh, forgive me James uh, chapter 2, 14 through 26. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a hugely long passage, but I'm, I'm going to read it quickly and then summarize it really quickly to make the point. What good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? 
Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is of no accomplish, uh, is not of accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was it not your ancestor Abraham, who, who was considered righteous by what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Do you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did? And in Scripture it was fulfilled, as it was said of Abraham, who believed God, and it was accredited to him as righteousness, and that he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, not by faith alone. So I want to summarize that really quickly because this has to do with the motive. And it's, it's summarized this way. Faith without deeds is dead. Deeds without faith is dead. Meaning that if I claim to have faith but have no, no willingness to express that faith, I need to go back to, to part A again and say, uh, do I truly have a living, saving faith? Or if I claim to have, have deeds but I do not express those deeds in faith, then that's also a, su a serious red flag. That is the red flag that, that tells us that, uh, that uh, we are far more humanist than we are an aspiring Christian. And so the, the fundamental principle is deeds without faith is dead. Faith without deeds is dead. It's deeds in faith is alive in Christ. And if you want to summarize that passage, it, can, it, it can't be any more distilled. I don't think it can be any more distilled than that. The deeds in faith is alive in Christ. That's what Lemuel's mother is talking about when she tells, Saul, or tells Lemuel uh, to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves or the rights of those who are destined to speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. It's not just a, a benevolence. It is an expression of your faith, your faith that has shaped your character, the faith that has given you compassion, that you don't well that up on your own, that, that faith that has given you compassion for someone other than yourself. And that's why it's so important to remember the passage from Ezekiel, because that's what was lost in the lives of Israel over, the, over many, many years, is that a care for another. And the, the faith that was, that, that was expressed became a rogue repetition, but not a living faith. Israel as a nation had strayed desperately, and that was one of the greatest indicators that they had strayed. So with that, as a, with that kind of character study quickly by Lemuel's mother, uh, I want to transition into part two. And again, uh, we can use that as a bit of a, um, a preamble into part two. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's now turn our attention to, to a, the, the kind of the meat and potatoes of, of this, particular pa uh, this particular chapter. Now, if your scripture that you have, if the text you have, has a little uh, characterizing, italicized language at the, uh, scattered throughout uh, the scripture, uh, typically I stay away from those because the editor of that, partic that particular copy of scripture uh, has placed those in there. To, to, to characterize the, the, the nature of the text that follows it. And uh, personally, it's my discipline uh, not to engage those because I am less interested in how the editor characterizes what I'm about to read and more interested in hearing from the voice of the Holy Spirit as I read. Having said that, this is probably a fair one. Um, and it, in my scripture, in, in my copy, the editors have put at the beginning, right before verse 10, uh, their editorial note. Portrait of the Virtuous Wife. And uh, I, I, I believe it to be very fair to be able to say that what we're about to read is the portrait of a virtuous wife. So to begin, uh, I want to, to put a kind of a contrast on the table that gives us a, a, a rather vivid uh, picture. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's a contrast. In the late 1800s, uh, Oscar Wilde, play, English playwright, um, who became wildly popular, probably one of the most popular playwrights in, uh, in, uh, in all of England, uh, had written a book. And this was in the, the latter part of his, his, 
his uh, career. So it was in the, in the latter uh, 1800s uh, that he wrote um, the, uh, the, the book, The um, Picture of Dorian Gray. And if you've not read the book, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a fairly twisted uh, 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 novel written by a very twisted mind in Oscar Wilde. Uh, and it's, uh, it's dark, um, it's humanist, uh, it's vicious in, in some parts. Uh, and, but it, it, I would just characterize just this one, just the, the, the principal nature of, of, of the story of Dorian Gray. Dorian was a, was a young, uh, extremely handsome man uh, who uh, played a bit of the naive part uh, initially, uh, feigning a, 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 um, a, 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 a vague understanding of, of how handsome he was and how attractive he was to, uh, to other people. Uh, but uh, uh, he knew well that uh, he was handsome and, and his, his handsomeness opened every door in his life, that there was there was there seemed to be no party he wasn't invited to, no dinner he wasn't a guest at, no privilege that he didn't he wasn't entitled to, uh, no one that did not want to befriend uh, and engage and embrace uh, the uh, the young Dorian, and he uh, uh, slowly uh, lost that thin veil of of, of quote naivete and uh, became very confident uh, in. The, uh, the nature of his appearance and the, uh, the, the, the kind of the golden ticket that this was to all that, of the pleasures that life had to offer. And he had commissioned for himself a, uh, a portrait uh, of himself. He was so enamored with his, his own appearance that he, he commissioned for himself a portrait of himself. So the portrait was, uh, was painted and uh, Dorian um, uh, held this portrait. And through the course of, of the next uh, uh, several months, uh, Dorian, every time he gazed at the portrait, the portrait began to change uh, and supernaturally change, uh, where uh, the chiseled features became uh, a little softer, the, uh, uh, the illuminated skin became to, uh, began to become a little more dull and gray in spots. And as, as time went on and Dorian saw this portrait uh, metamorphosis, uh, uh, changing, uh, in uh, right in front of him, day after day, uh, he began to see sores open up on his face, and his hair become disheveled and turning gray, and some of it falling out, and and uh, cankers, and 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 as as time went on, uh, the 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 maggots and decay of, of, of parasites began to form uh, and crawl upon uh, the surface of the skin of this portrait, and the the portrait continued to deteriorate more and more and more. And this became uh, uh, gruesome and horrifying to Dorian because at first he, th uh, he thought he had been cursed, but that's not what at all had, had was happening. What was happening is the more he became self-obsessed with himself, the more the portrait revealed not what he looked like, but what his soul was. That, that when he looked in the mirror, he saw the, 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 the beautiful young man that he appeared to be. When he looked at the portrait, he saw the, the, the systematic putrefaction of the soul that was within him. And this dichotomy uh, just ebbed at young Dorian in a merciless way. And so it, it, the portrait of Dorian Gray, or the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, is a revelation of the nature of the soul of uh, this young man who, who, who rode the way physical beauty and everything that the world would value at the expense of the disfigurement of the soul and the portrait is what revealed to him the nature of his soul. So in uh, uh, the Art Institute in Chicago, uh, it's um, uh, Ivan Albright. Ivan Albright painted this uh, about one and a half times life size uh, uh, picture of, of young Dorian uh, in his uh, almost lifeless, deteriorated, and disfigured state. Uh, and the portrait, of course, is rightly titled uh, The Portrait of Dorian Gray. It hangs in the Chicago Art Institute, and in, in, um, you can Google it to, to see it. But it is, uh, it's a fairly gruesome image of the soul of Dorian. Um, that, I, I, I open with that because it is, um, uh, it's, the, it's the opposite of what we're about to see here. So as we, as we look at the, the, the disfigurement 
of the mind that disfigures the soul in Dorian. We will see a picture here of the nobility of the heart or the mind or the soul that is revealed in the character of the life. And that's the contrast that I, that, that I, I want to use to, to open here is that in the same way that uh, that, that the deteriorating soul that has not been fed the bread of life and um, that even in the most handsome of, uh, and most beautiful of people, the deterioration of the soul that has not been fed the bread of life deteriorates beneath the surface and it is not seen unless we awaken, awaken to the reality that the nourishment of the body and the nourishment of the soul are two very very different things both very vital here and so we see now this picture of a young woman uh, who is uh, virtuous in 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 every meaningful way and that the, the the placing the spirit or the soul or the character uh, the mind of this young woman at the forefront that's what's seen in the mirror and then uh, uh, allowing that to shape the character of this young woman. The portrait that we would see of this young woman and the young woman that's seen in the mirror would be likely the same person. And so that's where I want to be I want to begin in this in this particular passage. So to, so as we begin and there's probably a couple places that you can do this in scripture. This is this is one of them at least I think it's one of them where we want to go to the end of this passage and allow the end of this passage to characterize what we will read from verse 10 to the end. And the end, I would say by the end, I mean verse 30. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And that's that's the that's the the, the character of what Lemuel's mother is saying is is that 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 my son I think she she actually gives a, a fairly endearing title. Oh my, uh, oh my son, oh son of my womb. O oh, son of my vows, that that uh, there is a there is a, a, a deep seated affectionate vestment that 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 Lemuel's mother is making in him or bond that she's making him when she says, "Please listen to me on this. This is this is this is vitally important here." And then she she uh, connects her and her son in this way where she says. The, the son of my womb, son of my vows, that you, you're the, you, that you are, you are the product of a vow that I, that I made, and I'm going to suggest a vow that I made to your father when we wed, and from that vow produced of my womb, you, Lemuel, you are a part of me, and I value you so highly, and and I, 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 I liken this uh, to. The way God sees us, when I breathed, when God breathed life into us, He He made a deposit of Himself into us. When He claimed that He made us in His like and likeness and image, there is a deposit of Himself, a piece of Himself. You can hear almost the, the a very similar language between how God said that He created man and woman uh, in His likeness and image, and breathed life into us, and the way Lemuel's mother speaks of Lemuel. The son of my vow, the vow I made to your father, the the son of my womb, the product of that vow, you are it's a, of, of high value to me, Lemuel. And so she says, she says, now, now hear me on this. Um, as as you look into the world, you can fall in love with what you see with your eyes, but be very careful. Fall in love with what you see with your heart. And here's what I want you to hear. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. Not to discredit the, the charm of a young lady or the beauty of a young lady, uh, but understand that, that, that the true bond for you and your spouse, that's going to be a woman who fears the Lord. Now, that is a woman to be praised. That is the woman you to, uh, are to look for. And in that, when you find that, the rest falls into place. The rest, it, it, to use common language, the rest you get for free. But look first for the heart of a woman. This is, this is easy to, to see in David uh, when, uh, uh, when 
God is speaking to Samuel and it says that, that uh, uh, all of these attributes that, that, that you've attributed to what you think is a right king that you've selected Saul. Mm, see, man looks at outward appearance. I look at the heart. And when I look at the heart, I'm looking at David's heart. That's the one. So the, even, even from God's perspective, in, in almost literal terms, God is saying the same thing. Seek first the heart that follows me. This is um, uh, 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 certainly what Christ said when he said, seek first the kingdom of God and all things will be added unto you. Seek first that virtuous heart, that woman who reveres the Lord and the woman who reveres the Lord, she is to be praised. That is where you should focus your attention. So as we begin with uh, uh, looking at this portrait of a young lady, it's important to say that that, uh, important to say that that there is nothing wrong with physical beauty. There is nothing wrong with a charming spirit, um, a, a, a captivating personality. These are of high value, and 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 God certainly does not look down upon those poorly upon these things. He said, "Keep it in the right perspective, though. That that just as Dorian rode the coattails of his youth, of his beauty." Uh, his soul rotted beneath the surface. Look beneath the surface. Find that pure heart beneath the surface. The rest you get for free. So let's let's look at at the nature of this um, this uh, um, uh, this young woman. And if you'll if you'll allow me here for a second too, I want to include Genesis two eight uh, really quick um, uh, before we we actually look at that portrait. Genesis two eight. Uh, uh, a long time ago, I read this book called Robert uh, Robert Fulham. Uh, Everything I ever really needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. It was a a, a fun little book, um, yeah, to some degree rather humor humanist, but a humorous. Uh, uh, but um, uh, basically, what Fulham was saying was that uh, all of the great virtues in life uh, I experienced, or I was exposed to very early in life. That the things that really mattered in life that shaped who he became, uh, he, ran, he learned these lessons. These lessons were presented to him. He learned these lessons later in life, but these lessons were presented to him. The foundations, the, the, the hidden gems were placed in his life when he was just a very, very young boy in kindergarten. And so when he wrote this book, it was a rather of a memoir book, and he, he, he thinks back upon his youth and he says, early in life, here are the, here are the foundational stones that really shaped me to became to be the man that I am today. Sometimes Genesis is like that. It's that the, these are the, the, the foundational stones that we can return to again and again and again to, to learn why it is and how it is that God created us and that why it is and how, or, or they're the benchmarks that help us see when we stray from the way that we were created. So when I go back here to Genesis, again, as a kind of a, a one of those foundational stones of, of our life, We'll go back to Genesis 2.8. Now, Genesis 2.8 uh, reads, actually, Genesis 2.18, not 2.8, Genesis 2.18. Uh, this is, uh, in, in context, uh, God has created um, uh, the, uh, the earth, the firmament, uh, the sea, life, animals, everything. We're in the sixth day. And he's created Adam. Adam has named the animals. Uh, Adam is at the point now of recognizing that every animal has its mate except him. And then God s expresses this. It says, the Lord said, this is Genesis 2.18, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, this is before the institution of marriage, before the introduction, uh, introduction of, of, of Eve to Adam. This is the expressed will of God, where God says, uh, it is not good. For man to be alone, that man needs a mate. Mankind needs to be. And now this, and, and again, this isn't an afterthought. Uh, I would suggest to you. Well, let me say it this way: This is not an afterthought. When this is a part of the unfolding or the unpacking of the initial creation of man and woman, he created them, male and female. The plan was to create both to complete, uh, but. First man was created, man named all the animals. I'm going to suggest to you with a great deal of fervency that that was intentional. That it's not that God did not know that man was incomplete without woman. Man needed to know 
that man was complete, incomplete without woman. And I, I want to make, uh, I, I want to, I want to take just a moment's liberty here to say that mankind needs to know that mankind is complete without a spouse. So woman needs to know that she is incomplete without her husband. Man needs to know that he is incomplete without his wife. That mankind needs to know that they are incomplete without each other. That the man and woman, the union of man and woman, is the expression that God created when he said, uh, I want to create mankind, man, mankind, in my own likeness and image, that it is the two together. So uh, I, I, the reason I'm highlighting this particular passage is that the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. And I, I, if you're inclined to underline, um, I wanna, I, I'd ask you to underline, it is not good. The, the proclamation that God said is, man alone is not good. Inversely, you can say, man with his mate, the two together is good. A long time ago, Gail and I uh, uh, facilitated a, uh, um, a, a large format, uh, multi-part uh, seminar over and over again. I think we did it for, I don't know, three, four years straight. Uh, called Growing Kids God's Way. It was an 18-part, I think, uh, seminar on uh, raising your children in, in, uh, in biblically and uh, created by Gary and Anne Marie Ezzo. And it was a, a, a fantastic uh, a contribution to our lives when, when, uh, when, when we were early in the process of raising our children. And I would recommend it to any, anybody. Um, and the, the very last session there was a session that was the, 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 I'm sorry the very last session was a session titled the uh, father's mandate and it was completely dedicated uh, to the, the role and the responsibility of a father um, and it was it was very soundly done well the second year that we led this uh, this this large format um, um, uh, uh, seminar uh, we had heard just by listening to the radio, uh, a woman by the name of Patricia Ashley. And Patricia Ashley uh, is a, just a very, very strong-voiced, uh, um, uh, very small-framed, very wiry um, uh, lady who had a, a, a beautiful testimony about how she personally came to and then led her husband to Christ. And one the, the, the line that I remember most fervently uh, from, from this woman was that it was a turning point line in her life where she had hit a wall with how, how, how haggard her life had become apart from God, how haggard her marriage had become, that they were on the brink of divorce and Christ rescued her and then her marriage. And that the turning point in her life was when she read that passage that it is not good for man to be alone. And she put her Bible down, she went into the bathroom, she looked in the mirror and she says, you are a good thing. And she looked at herself and said that you, by God's proclamation, Patricia, you are a good thing. You are a good thing in this marriage. You are a good thing in God's eyes. And that is, that, that's, what, that's what Lemuel's mom is saying when he says, that's what you need to be looking for. By God's proclamation, that good thing, that good person, by God's definition of good, that, that, that divine, that divine goodness, that divine character that God invests in a woman who, by, by Lemuel's language here, uh, who fears the Lord or reveres the Lord or is faithful to the Lord. That is the goodness that you need to be looking for. I just remember it in, from Patricia's language that, uh, and she was very funny the way she the way she said it. That she looked in the mirror. You are a good thing, and that is what that that every young man should be looking for. Good by God's definition. So so starting at verse ten here, uh, a wife of noble character who can find it proposes a question. Lemuel's mother proposed. Uh, propo uh, poses this to Lemuel to say, um, can you find can you, uh, a, a wife of noble character? I mean, nobody sets out to find a spouse uh, that is ignoble. No one sets out to uh, find a, a spouse that is cruel and heartless and brutal, uh, 
who will mistreat them, who doesn't care for them or love them. Every one of us sets out to find a spouse that is the exact opposite of that. And Lemuel's mother uses a, the, one of the great words that we don't use nearly as much and almost has lost its meaning in our culture today, noble. Who can find a noble wife? Uh, and so he, she poses it to him to say that, um, uh, uh, does such a thing exist? Does a noble spouse, is, does, does that even exist? And uh, it's not a rhetorical question. She's, she's prompting Lemuel to think with her because she's not going to say, memorize this Lemuel and you'll be happy. She, what she's saying is, is that you must embrace what I'm saying and you must allow this wisdom to embrace you. Uh, and again, I'll hearken back just one last time here in, in, in Proverbs. Remember that, that Proverbs is not transactional. The, the, the value of Proverbs is the value of the person of wisdom in our life is to shape a quality of life. And Lemuel's mother is saying that there is a quality of life, a good quality of life that is found in uh, a spouse, uh, a good spouse, a good by God's definition. And you should do it again. So who can find a noble life? Well, the, it's not a rhetorical question. Lemuel, you can. You can find a noble wife, but it will not be found with your eyes alone. You need to be searching with your spirit for the nature of the woman whom God will cross your path with. And so when, we, when she opens this, she opens this with a wife of noble character who can find. The first word she gives us is the word noble. I want, so again, I, I underline a lot of stuff in my Bible, and so I've, I've underlined a series here. So I'm going to just kind of move through here fairly quickly with some descriptives or some adjectives that Lemuel's mother gives Lemuel to say. And just put these when put these down. Hold on to these. These are what's going to help you dis discern and determine. So here we go. Uh, noble. Uh, she's worth more than rubies. Uh, that that you want someone who will have full confidence, you can have full confidence in, that will bring you good, that she selects and she works and she brings and she gets up early, she provides, she considers, feels, she plants, she works, she trades, she holds, she opens her arms to the needy, she extends her hands to the poor, she has no fear, she makes things, she um, is clothed well, she can laugh, she can speak wisdom, she is attentive and she watches over the affairs of her, her, of her family. All of these adjectives are adjectives that Lemuel's mother said. These are, these are the, uh, the, the, the character of a young lady that you should be looking for, Lemuel, uh, uh, as you consider of, of all of the possible options that you may have uh, this is the character of the young woman that you should look for. Now, we're not going to try to go through every one of these, uh, but let's just look at, at, a, at a few. Uh, uh, let's just kind of uh, grab a group. Um, uh, uh, she, she's industrious. She selects choice wools and flaxes and works with her hands to create uh, a garment. She... Um, uh, brings food in for her family. She provides for her family and those who work for her. Um, she'll cons she's a, a, a bit of a, a, of a real estate magnet. She considers fuel. She buys it from profits she earns from that. She plants the vineyards. Uh, uh, she works vigorously. She trades. She stays up late at night. She's diligent. She's not slothful. Uh, her, um, uh, so it, I mean, if you just take that group here, um, uh, I, uh, I, I was reading all of this uh, again recently and thought, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. It's, how is it that so many people claim that Christianity is so oppressive to women and speaks so poorly of women and, and shackles women and puts women down when the Bible speaks so beautifully about what God sees as the, 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 the beautiful woman? The woman that reveres him, that loves him, that seeks him, the that her her nature and her character is is hugely industrious, 
she has a strong business mind. She's very capable with her hands. She's very quick in her wit. She speaks really well. She cares for her family. She cares about her husband. Uh, she has value on the family name. Uh, you, you'd be hard pressed to 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 bring up the feminist manifesto and say. Isn't that most of the stuff that the feminist feel that that is so of, of so high such a high value and that um, that that should be um, uh, should be accessible to them and you would say yeah your your young lady who 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 has cultivated herself as a feminist. But that's what God wants for you. God wants you to be industrious. God wants you to consider a field and to buy it, to, 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 to make with your hands, to, 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 uh, uh, to see value and to earn value, um, to, uh, um, to provide for yourself and to provide for yourself in such a, a, a powerful way that when you can, you can provide for another. Um, that you that you can be a woman who has no fear, uh, that you can be a woman who can enjoy life and laugh. This is when I when I read this, I'm I'm thinking what what the what the the, the modern feminist wants. In many respects, not all, but in many respects, was God's plan for a young lady to begin with, that the that. The value that he vests into young women is such of, of an extraordinary calling that 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 a young man who sees this is compelled by this to see value as God assigns value and to find desire beyond simply what he looks like, but finds desire for the heart of a of a young woman like this. This is it, this is this is part of what makes this uh, passage so timeless uh, uh, prior to uh, from the from the dawn of time to Lemuel's day from Lemuel's day to now that it's 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 the timelessness the value of what Lemuel's mother is sharing with us is uh, is um, is inestimable you, you, you it's it's hard to take anything away from this, and it's hard to find anything that that Lemuel's mother has left out in the value of a virtuous young woman, and um, she's telling her son, as you look into the world, young Lemuel, uh, you can train wreck your life if you're not careful, if you choose the uh, the substancelessness of a relationship that finds its value only in the surface appearance in 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 the value of only what the, the that that meets the felt need but has made no vestment no effort no 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 query into the the, the soul of the other person then you will most assuredly train wreck your life. But if you will listen to me, Lemuel, that the joy of being completed by a spouse as God created you to be completed, to be one flesh, uh, uh, th that can be yours if you, will f if you will hear me on this. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a bit of a word to Lemuel here also. If you get to verse 23, uh, Le, uh, when, when his mother is saying that these are the, 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 the characteristics of this virtuous or this noble spouse, this noble uh, uh, wife, uh, uh, we get to verse 23. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes a seat among the elders of the land. Uh, that um, Lemuel, this is... This is not just the nature of who she is. This is how she makes you 
to be a better man. Um, a line from a film, uh, a compliment there that, uh, and I won't go into the details of the film, just the, the line will be good enough, uh, where uh, um, a man looks across a, a dining table at uh, his date and he's struggling uh, in the relationship and, and she demands uh, uh, after uh, just an appalling insult that the date is over if uh, if he doesn't uh, if he doesn't say something nice to her, and he says, "Okay, here it comes," <laughs> and he looks across the table and says, "You make me want to be a better man," and she says, "Quite honestly, that's the that's the most beautiful compliment I've ever received in my life." That that's what that's what what Lemuel's mother is telling Lemuel here uh, in in a in a manner of speech. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. Lemuel, look into your own future. Uh, consider that, that the, the, the value of the, the godly relationship between you and your spouse will make you a better man. It will complete you, to use, to use God's language, that, that you are incomplete. It is not good for you to be alone. It is good for, for you to have a spouse. That spouse will complete you. I've said on more than one occasion that that um, uh, my wife has fixed things in me that couldn't be fixed any other way, and that after my wife, my children, being a father, has changed me and fixed things in me that couldn't be fixed any other way. And I credit being a husband to my wife and a father to my sons as not just what I have vested into them, but what those relationships have vested into me to make me uh, a, a man closer to the man that God has created in his likeness and image than I would have been any other way. Lemuel's mother is saying that Lemuel you're going to sit at the city gate and you'll be respected when you live the life that I'm describing for you. When you enjoy the beauty of, of a married relationship the way I'm describing it for you. This will make you a better man. This will make you a respected man. A man that can sit with his head in honor at the city gates amongst the other men, amongst the other elders. I mean, you know, you see how she describes it. It's it's that you will be respected the city gate where you take your seat amongst the elders of the land. That the, and and not all not not all people are, are are leaders, but if you can you can be respected amongst your peers. It, th this would be the equivalency of what Lemuel's mother is talking about. If you can be respected amongst your peers by the value and the quality of the life you live. By the, a strong marriage, that that will make you a better man. Uh, so, th we 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 should close here. But I I want to I want to just include one more. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction on her tongue. That the woman, the noble, the wife of noble character, who reveres the Lord and is praised, who has made secondary her charm. And her beauty, but made primary her reverence for the Lord. This is a woman from whom which good counsel will come. And a, a fulfilling marriage between two people needs to be two people that invest in good counsel. And by good counsel, with without question, we're talking about godly counsel, the counsel that 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 God can speak through your spouse into your life through my spouse into my life, uh, that that comes from a woman who fear, a spouse, a woman specifically here, a woman who reveres the Lord, from a woman of noble character. Uh, and uh, God is under no obligation to speak um, uh, the beauty of the divine voice and personage of wisdom uh, through those who do not follow him. Even though there are times that he does, those certainly are not to be um, uh, 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 to be assumed. 
those were those were specific divine gifts. But to live a life devoted to God uh, and and walking in His will and in His way is a is a is a conduit of His wisdom through whom which you will benefit, uh, young Lemuel. Uh, so, uh, is this written to? A young man as he's looking for a wife or is this written to a young lady as she's preparing herself uh, for married life is it written to uh, an older woman as she invests into younger women in the in the tightest manner is it written to an older man as he as he invests into his son and I would say yes 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 and yes uh, the uh, the language and the narrative is specifically written uh, from a mother to her son but the timeless and the breadth of, of this uh, timelessness and the breadth of the value of this language uh, it can can fall in in every meaningful way uh, in all four of those categories uh, uh, in in our group uh, much of us have 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 raised our children our children are launched our children are having children of their own in, in some cases uh, and us this is uh, this is most certainly uh, uh, um, counsel to be vested into our sons-in-laws and our daughters-in-laws and certainly uh, through them and alongside them into our grandchildren. That that uh, noble character that God has vested uh, through his spirit into us uh, is not for us to consume but for us to pass along. Uh, so uh, as, we, as we close here, uh, this is... This is a, a, a bit of, a, of, of a, uh, a great place now to transition back to the other side of the coin, which we will next week. And then we will come back forward into the Song of Solomon and do two weeks uh, in the Psalm of, Song, Psalm of Solomon, Song of Solomon, uh, um, uh, exploring the, uh, uh, the breadth of the marriage relationship. So as we close out this morning, this morning let's just let's just close in prayer and uh, be grateful that uh, that God created us as beings incomplete. Grateful that I, I put it in first person that I am incomplete apart from the woman for whom which God created for me. Um, I liken it to. Um, bit once when, when I was having a conversation with a friend that uh, um, uh, when God created Eve he caused Adam to go into a deep sleep and from him he took one of Adam's ribs and from that rib formed Eve and then awoke Adam and introduced the two of them and that is that is the origin of the introduction of Adam to Eve and then it is from that that the one flesh bond finds its 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 origin. Uh, I was I was quipping maybe to a friend that uh, uh, all along I didn't know it, but I was I wanted my rib back. That before I got married and I considered uh, um, uh, marriage and who to marry, uh, I never really knew that what I was really looking for was my rib back. And that one rib from, from which God crafted my spouse, he brought back to me. And I value that picture in my own marriage uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a quest to find that one person that God chose for me. And as, if, if, as I am am able to offer thoughts to another young man uh, ab about marriage and about uh, uh, sl uh, choosing that spouse. Uh, I include that language, that what you need to be looking for is that woman who's your rib. You want your rib back. You want to be complete again. You want to be whole. And that's that, that, that wife of noble character from verse 10 who reveres the Lord from verse 30. That's what, she, that, that's what she's going to be when you find the right one. So, Father, we thank you for the blessing of being incomplete apart from your completion of us. 
that we were crafted and created in your likeness and image as married people, as one a one flesh union. You created us to, to be uh, um, a reflection of you in that union of marriage and that you, you created us for the purpose of creating godly offspring. We thank you for the gift that you have given us. We would have never chosen it this way. We would never even have dreamed it this way, uh, uh, even in, 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 the, in the breadth of our imaginations. We would never have been so creative as to have come up with, with the, the, the method and the, uh, the, the, the union that you have created. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you that you have blessed us by showing it to us uh, in practical, meaningful, purposeful ways. It's in Christ's name we give you thanks. Amen.